Thank you, Lord. If you need a Bible, uh, raise your hand and one of the ushers could get you one. Raise your hand high so they can see you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to preach today. Yay! My name is Red Sevilla. I'm the director of New Life CDC, the Community Development Corporation, whose mission is to come alongside the poor, the marginalized in this neighborhood. The title here is um, Missional Impact in Christ for Good Works. Missional Impact, we're in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, starting verse 3. And then there's a beautiful passage in chapter 2 as well that's beautifully connected to the one in chapter 1 that I'm going to put together. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness to us, Lord God. And Father, today I pray for a fresh revelation, Lord God, of the blessings that you've bestowed upon us, Lord. Father, that we may respond in gratitude and thanksgiving. And Father, I pray for, uh, as well for ears to hear, eyes to see, Lord God, a heart to receive from you and hear your invitation toward good works. Thank you, Lord God. You're welcome here. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me start by asking a question. Do you consider yourselves missionaries? Are you a missional worker? A friend of mine who's a believer, uh, she went up to me one day and she said that, you know, I, I don't think I could ever be a missionary. Uh, meanwhile, she's a Christian. And what she was probably talking about was going overseas somewhere. And I was a little, a little confused by her statement just because once you're a Christian, you're a missionary or a missional worker, and I'll use those two interchangeably. Once you're a Christian, you're a missionary. And the reason why is because the word missional means to be sent or to be dispatched. And we're all sent. If you recall what Jesus says, he said, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. You're sent. And so we're missional from the get-go if we're a follower of Christ. And that's why for us here at New Life, it's our fifth M, being missional. The second reason why I was a little confused was because you don't have to go to a foreign country for you to be missional. You can, but you can also be missional at your workplace, which is what we spoke about a few weeks back. But you can also be missional here in this local neighborhood, in the neighborhood of Corona and Elmhurst. Now, I recognize that some of you don't live in Elmhurst or Corona. You may live in Brooklyn or the city on, or in Long Island. You might be saying, you know, I'll be missional where I am. I just come here for church. You know, no thank you, Red. But actually, we here at New Life, we are a regional church. We draw from different parts of the city, but we have a local focus. And so our local focus is in this Corona where we were birthed in Elmhurst, where we currently are. And if you're called to this church, you're invested in this neighborhood because this is who we are. And so each of us here is invited to be able to invest a piece of your hearts here in this neighborhood. We're called here. And I'll give you a few reasons why it's really critical for us at this point, especially in this neighborhood, for us to be this missional community. The first is that we're aware that human and sex trafficking exists throughout the whole five boroughs. But do you know what percentage of that activity is in Queens? 60%. And according to one official, the epicenter, is his, his words, the mecca of this activity is on Roosevelt Avenue in Corona and Elmhurst neighborhood. The second reason why we need missional workers here is the rate of dropouts among young adults is greatest among young adults of Dominican, Ecuadorian, and Mexican descent. In Queens, the highest concentration of Dominicans, Ecuadorians, and Mexicans are in the Corona and Elmhurst neighborhood, our neighborhood. So what does that mean for us? The third thing is that just a few blocks away, there are 380, this is stuck here, if you could advance that, there are 380 homeless children. Those are statistics that were given to us. 380 homeless children 
who are currently looking for permanent housing, and yet across the street, there are apartments that are vacant. So what does that mean for us? Now, I have good news. These issues, God's not worried about them. Doesn't take him by surprise. He's not shocked because he has a solution. And that solution is you. His sent ones. Oh gosh, read me. I don't know if I could do that. As the Father has sent him, so he sends you. And so I imagine you might think this, this might bring some anxiety, some insecurity. But when we begin to answer his invitation, we begin to, there can easily form this gap, this between a missional community and then a great need. And then maybe out of fear or insecurity or what have you, we don't bridge that gap. And yet there's an invitation because we're the sent ones to be able to walk that gap. A friend of mine was letting me know that if he came to this church and wasn't serving in this local neighborhood, for him, he felt like he's using the neighborhood, just coming for church. And that's why for him, he wants to be able to invest in this local area. And you know, when you begin to walk this gap, who we are to this great need, when you get to that other side, you're not, yes, you're going to find families in need, in hardship, but you know, you know what you're also going to find is, you're also going to find hope. Because Christ is there waiting. Christ is there as well. And so you go, but you receive in return because you meet Christ. And so how do we bridge this gap? How do we walk that gap? The answer is in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. If you could turn there, chapter 1, starting in verse 3. The city of Ephesus had great needs as well. It was densely populated. One of the seven wonders of the world is actually located in the city of Ephesus. And there was a temple there. But the temple was dedicated to this pagan goddess Diana. And just to give you a sense of the forces of darkness at work there, the priests in that temple were prostitutes. And so Paul in his writing, and you should read through Acts 19 and 20, uh, Revelations 2 as well, just in your own Bible study to see the kind of issues that Paul was dealing with in Ephesus. And so in this passage, Paul exhorts them toward this missional impact by describing two things that God did. Two things. Now, if we get these two things that God did, these two things, these two works of God will allow us to walk this gap and propel us toward missional impact like we've never seen before in this neighborhood. If we receive these two things, these two works of God, you were meant to walk this gap. Let's receive these two things. Let's start in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Every spiritual blessing, and then he begins to list these blessings. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him. In love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood. Thank you, Lord. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. And then in chapter 2, starting in verse 8, he continues with the blessings. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand or in advance so that we would walk in them. Amen. The first thing that God does that propels us toward missional impact is that God has blessed us beyond measure. From verse 3, God has blessed us beyond measure. But what does blessing have to do with being missional? What does blessing have to do with being missional? Everything. 
Because what God chooses to do is he chooses to bless you before he sends you. He chooses to bless you and then he sends you to be missional. That's why off the bat, starting in verse 3, it says that you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So that means if there exists a spiritual blessing, it's been purchased for you. It means that if there exists a spiritual blessing, it's yours. That's what that's saying. And I'll confess something to you. When I used to hear that, blessed with every spiritual blessing, it used to be in one ear and out the other, to be honest. Until the summer of 2013, where something beautiful happened to me, transformed my life, and I'm actually a different person now than I was before 2013. And it wasn't dramatic. There was this preacher, uh, I was part of an audience listening to this preacher talking about these very blessings. And how he said, he said that he, was re he received this powerful revelation of the blessings of God. So much so that he was transformed by it. Now he's influencing thousands all across the globe. And as he was beginning to talk about these blessings, he quoted Matthew 10.8. Matthew 10.8 says, Freely you have received, freely give. And so what he was talking about was freely he received and he wanted to freely give this revelation of the blessings of God. And so what he does is he begins to pray. And when he began to pray, I was like, okay, Matthew 10, 8, freely you receive, freely give. I used to think that was like for food or something like that. But if you go to Matthew 10, the context is something spiritual and powerful. Freely you have received the, the kingdom, freely give. And so I'm like, okay, I'll receive when he prayed, something overcame me. I began to weep uncontrollably, up to four times in that day. Quite embarrassing, to be honest. And what happened was I began to get filled with just this powerful revelation of the blessings that, that God purchased for us. So you know what I want to do just right now, even in the middle of this sermon? I want to pray for you. I want to pray that freely, that preacher received, freely he gave, I received, freely I receive, freely I want to give. Just this powerful revelation of the blessings that Christ purchased for us. And so if you're willing to receive, I just invite you to close your eyes and just put your hands like this. And I'm going to pray just the same prayer that Paul prayed for the Ephesians in chapter 1, verse 17, when he said that the Ephesians may receive a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that they may know not the blessings better, but that they may know him better. So, Father, hello, Lord. Here we are. Father, you know what you did in my life, Lord God, and how you changed me. My goodness, Lord God, how you woke me up to the blessings that you have for me. And so, Father, now, Lord, I speak to my brothers and sisters here, Freely I receive, freely I give. Receive the blessings that come from the Father. Receive fresh revelation from the throne room of God that you may know him better. Receive in the name of Jesus. And Father, let me be so bold to say that whatever you did in me, Lord, do even more for my brothers and sisters here, even now, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So he begins to list these blessings in Ephesians 1, and it comes off like this registry of gifts, really beautiful. And even though each of these really warrant, each of these blessings warrant its own sermon. I'm just going to touch on some of them. Here are the blessings. Starting in verse 3, it says that we're blessed. Again, if there's a spiritual blessing that exists, it's been purchased for you. It's yours. Every spiritual blessing. He's chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. That means even before Genesis 1, he already knew your name. Even before Genesis 1, he already had you in mind. 
You're chosen. In verse 5, it says that we've been adopted as sons and daughters. And I'm sorry to say that when he adopted you, he wasn't adopting a cute little kid. Sorry to say. Think of how you were before you gave your life to Christ when he adopted you. Some of you were far from cute. In fact, the word says that you were enemies in your minds and your hearts. You're enemies of God. And so what he did was he adopted enemies. Would you adopt enemies into your family? God did. And so he's either crazy or he's in love. Or crazy in love. In verse 6, we're accepted. If you're accepted by God, who has the nerve to reject you? Listen, I got, I got this, I'm in this dispute with this bank, and they sent me a letter. Underneath my name, it said delinquent. I'm like, delinquent? I'm accepted. <laughs> and then, in the same letter, they were threatening to lower my credit. And I just thought back to this, and I'm, you're threatening to lower my credit? The death of Christ has been credited to me as righteousness. You have no idea how much credit I have. <laughs> and so I'm not, I'm not, you know, I don't want you guys like, suddenly you miss your payments, you're delinquent. <laughs> I'm not delinquent, I'm, I'm accepted. I, you know, we, we preach like financial responsibility here. But the point is, I was like, listen, don't put titles on me. These are my titles. I'm accepted. Redeemed. I love this word. This is... This is pawn shop language. Like you've been sold off, stolen, being sold, but you've been redeemed, reclaimed by the rightful owner, repossessed from enemy territory. You've been redeemed to your father who rightfully owns you. This is us. This is a mirror, guys. This is who we are. Forgiven. I love how my friend puts it. Those that go to heaven aren't those that are good. Those that go to heaven are those that are forgiven. You give your life to Christ, you're forgiven. And then lastly, it says that grace is made to abound to us. It's like it lavishes over us. And the picture there is like standing underneath a waterfall of his exceedingly abundant grace made to abound over you. Riches. Grace pouring over you. And these, these words refer to you. This is who you are. You know, I imagine if you, when you come out of that waterfall, using car language, you don't come just with regular standard features. You come fully equipped. You're fully forgiven, fully redeemed, fully accepted, fully blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Just sticking with that car illustration, my wife and I recently um, were shopping around for a vehicle, a uh, used car, and so we were looking at like Toyotas and Hondas, and we landed on a Honda Civic, you know? Not too pricey, not too flashy, good Christian car, you know? <laughs> and so, as we were looking, it became painfully clear because we had a budget that the more you paid, the more features you got. The greater the value of your payment, the more features or blessings you get. And so what if, what if the payment is the blood of the Son of the Most High God? What do you get? If the payment was the death of the Son of God, what do you get? You get everything, everything, every spiritual blessing. You get all. No wonder he said, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not freely, along with him, give us all things? All things. And no wonder at the cross, when Christ died and he says, he said, it is finished. You know why he said it's finished? 
Because there's nothing left he could give. He gave you all. I mean, what, what more do we want? A resurrection? He gives that to us as well just to make sure we know what we have. And no wonder he says, he came so that you might have life and have it to the full. Do you think he came and paid that price so that you could be half filled? It's laughable to think of it. He came so that you might have life and have it to the full. And you know what happens to a full cup? A full cup overflows. A full cup overflows to its surroundings. And you, know to, you need to know what you have so you can know how you can give. And that's how it leads into being missional. A full cup overflows. And he's blessed you with every spiritual blessing. And so this, lead, this leads us to the second work of God, God that propels us that propels us toward the missional impact. The first, again, God has blessed us beyond measure. The second is that God has prepared good works for us to walk in. In other words, he blesses you and then he sends you. He blesses you and then he sends you. In chapter 2, verse 10, it reads that we are his workmanship created in Christ for good works. It's a great summary of the whole sermon. In Christ, every spiritual blessing for good works, for missional impact. And just a word that I want to unpack for us is just that word prepared and how God has prepared for us good works in advance for us to do. And let me give an illustration. Two to three times a week, um, my wife prepares uh, lunch for me. She's cool like that. And one day I asked her, why do, you have to, why do you have to prepare? Like, you know I could just go out and go get something. And she said, kind of sneered at me, she said, because I want you to eat well. And the reason why she gave me this look is because she knows the junk food that I go buy. And she wants me to eat healthy. And so she prepares with me in mind. And so just like my wife prepares this good meal for me, with me in mind, God prepares good works in advance for you, with you in mind. Works that are thought through, works that are orchestrated, works for you in advance that you might walk in them. This is what God does. And just as she prepares something, he prepares for you. And this is how I put it as well. We don't have to manufacture these good works, fabricate these good works, because, because God prepares them for us. This has really been a shift in my prayer life. How I typically pray is when I'm confused or uncertain about a certain act or how do I serve in this community, I'll ask God, God, what should I do? Oh, this sounds like a good idea. Maybe I should do this. You ever been in that space? Now what I pray is, as I meditate on Ephesians 1 and 2, God, I know that you've blessed me with every spiritual blessing, and I know that you've prepared for me good works. Give me ears to hear your invitation. Let me walk in them. And if you want to go through just the practicalities of hearing God better and hearing God well, Alpha, uh, the class Alpha has got a really good uh, segment in it, if you haven't taken it, as well as the Art of Hearing God class, which is coming up. Take those classes. But again, this, this has shifted my prayer. I know that there are good works prepared in advance for me. God, give me ears to hear the invitation that you have. May it shift your prayer life as well. And when my wife prepares for me, there's really an invitation, isn't there? Because what follows a preparation, think about it for a second, somebody prepares something for you, there's an invitation that follows. There's an invitation there. But sometimes I miss it. And sometimes I think you may miss it as well. And here's what happens. She puts the lunch by my bag or by the door, but I miss that lunch when I'm in a rush. When I'm rushing, I might miss it. I, listen, I'll still get to eat, but I could have had something better. 
I could have had something prepared by my beloved. That's why at New Life, the monastic is so powerful when it's coupled with the missional. Monastic so that I can slow down to be with God, and then there's the missional, offering myself to my community and to the world. Because I know for me, and maybe for you as well, I need to be able to slow down to be able to hear that invitation to the prepared good works for me, that I might walk in them. And so my question for you is, have you slowed down enough to hear the invitation of God for good works for you to walk in? I'm so thankful for New Life because the leadership here, even before me, has responded to this invitation. Since the 80s, we've been in this neighborhood, birthed in Corona. We're here in Elmhurst now. But two years ago, there was this invitation to go even deeper in this community. And the invitation was, was subtle and yet so significant, I almost missed it. And there's this invitation to go deeper into this community. And that invitation revolved around the conversion of this abandoned lot. Garbage all over it. Weeds were chest high. Garbage all over. People almost felt like an obligation to chuck their trash and construction debris whenever they walk by. New life gets involved, and this is what it looks like. Many people have gotten involved, children, teenagers, adults, families. This was taken just maybe a month or so ago. Beautiful transformation. The reason why this is significant is because our mission here at New Life is to be able to lead people to a deep personal relationship with Christ. And so that involves the transformation of people. But for the first time ever in our history, we move from just the transformation of people to the transformation of physical space, the transformation of physical place. So not just the transformation of people, but the transformation of place as well. We've never, do, we've never done that in the history of New Life. Outside of our building, we've never done that. And so this story, it's a beautiful story of conversion. A conversion of a lot to a garden. Neighbors who were previously strangers became friends. And as we did these things, we got to know a lot of the families in the neighborhood. And we got to know how they were doing as well. And we got pretty deep in our relationships to the point where we began, I began to see that many of they feel, uh, in their inner life, they feel orphaned rejected, condemned, and yet here we are, the sent ones, with a message of redemption, a message of acceptance, a message of forgiveness, to the point where, because of our interactions, one of them actually gave his life to Christ and recently got baptized here at New Life. Here's a revelation. The garden was a good work prepared in advance for us to do. It was a good work prepared in advance for our community to walk in. And we walked in it. And it's really just the beginning because the hand that prepared that lot is preparing good works in the schools, on Roosevelt Avenue, along Queens Boulevard, in these apartments across the street. There are good works prepared in advance for us to do. And so let me just tie it in for a second to uh, your own a personal situation. Think for a second to a situation that you're in that you wish was different. It could be something here uh, in Corona or Elmhurst, something that you wish that was different. Or it could be just at your workplace, maybe in your school, in your family, in your relationships, something that you wish was better. Something different, something that you wish was better in your own personal situation. Those are like abandoned lots waiting to be converted into gardens. Waiting for your mission and impact. You were sent into that space. You're the sent ones. You're blessed beyond measure, and God's got good works prepared in advance for you in that space. And my prayer is that you hear this invitation, that you hear this invitation that comes from God, and as you respond to that invitation, you begin to walk this missional gap. Most recently, there have been folks coming up to me, and um, it's wonderful. 
It's wonderful because a lot of these folks don't even know that they're sensing an invitation. They're asking me for volunteer opportunities, what else can they do? But really, they're responding to this invitation. They don't know, they're thinking of doing something good, some community service, but there's really a good work prepared in advance for them, in advance for you as well. And over the history, these are some of the folks that have responded. These are the 10 program heads of New Life CDC, and they've res responded over the years. And they're making a beautiful impact in our neighborhood. But this is what's coming up as well. And I know this invitation is stirring in some of you as well. There are these folks coming up to me. For instance, Anson and Jay want to just, in a deeper level, come alongside the poor, the marginalized in this neighborhood. Janet Valle, she's come up to me a couple, a couple of times already. Just There's these stirrings in her. She doesn't know what to do with it. And she wants to come alongside families who are distressed. Matt Mahoney, he lives in Washington Heights, and yet there's a piece of him that's invested here. And he wants to do more. There's Vashti, who's like this Moses. It's like how she leads people into service is beautiful. It's wonderful. And then there's this woman named Beth, and she wants to honor the life and the death of her sister by coming alongside women, marginalized women, who are trying to enter back into the workforce. And then another person is you, a sent one. What's the invitation that you're hearing? What's the invitation to a good work prepared in advance for you to do? You're blessed beyond measure, and there's a good work prepared in advance for you to do. May you hear that invitation. Let's have the worship team come up here as I go into just some practical next steps for us. Here's some practical next steps. And the word that I want you to hear as well is just to practice hearing the invitation that comes from God. Really fun. Because as you respond to these, the sense that you have, you have the freedom to fail. You have the freedom to fail, but as you fail, you get to know his voice. My sheep know my voice, he says. And so these are just some clear practical steps on how you can practice hearing the voice of God. There was a booklet uh, that was handed out to you. Uh, there may be some more in the back, 20-year anniversary of New Life CDC. Just as you look at that, there may be stirrings in there in terms of how you can get involved in the community. You can read the local paper. Pick them up at Nevada Diner, and you can pray for Elmhurst and Corona and see if there's an invitation there. Buy at local stores. And I'm not talking about Target. Buy at the mom and pop shops. Get to know the owners. Eat in this local neighborhood. And get to know your servers as well. There's an invitation in there. And lastly, just a shameless plug for me here. There's the auction next week. The proceeds of these go to New Life CDC. Participate and support us as we invest in this neighborhood. And so the last thing is um, stand up, if you don't mind, and I'll pray for you. And just the last thing is that serve connection uh, downstairs. Just as a way of, especially if you're not involved and you want to, there's a serve connection downstairs. These stairwells to my left and right are the express lanes down to the shell, shell room. And as you walk around in that shell room, there are different opportunities for you. Practice, simply practice hearing the voice of God in that invitation. Listen, you're blessed beyond measure. You're a sent one. And there's an invitation to the works prepared for you, that you might walk in it. Let's pray. Father, here we are, Lord God. Father, thank you, Lord God, for depositing the Holy Spirit in us, guaranteeing what is to come. And thank you, Lord God, through your Holy Spirit, Lord God, we can walk this gap. We can bridge this gap. Father, we are your sent ones, and we say, here we are. Father, we picture a waterfall of all your blessings on us. And we say thank you. We say thank you as well, Lord God, for the good works prepared in advance for us. Father, give us the grace to hear your invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we close our gathering, I want to invite the prayer team to come to my right. We have the Lord's table to my left. And uh, I want to thank Red for really serving us today. 
and unpacking the incredible truths of Scripture today that really filled us. And really, uh, when we gather, I love the two invitations. It's, it's, it's really a recognition that you have been blessed. Usually we pray, Lord, bless me. And he's saying, I already did. It's, it's already there for you. It's really a, a, a prayer that we should be asking is, Lord, can you help me to recognize that I've already been blessed, that you've already given me everything that I need. And it is out of that place that we are sent into the world. And so as followers of Jesus, when we gather on Sunday mornings, we gather for empowerment, to be empowered by the risen Jesus, to do what he's called us to do, to be what he has called us to be. And so you, do you hear the invitation? is really what uh, he's uh, calling us to. And, and I love that Red really pointed out he's prepared stuff for you to do. In your workplace, at home, in your school, this, there, there are relationships, there are opportunities that he's preparing for you right now for this week. This past week I was, I was in Stop and Shop and as I was finishing grocery shopping, I, uh, I saw a gentleman, young man, who was putting carts back to go back into the grocery store. And as I looked at him, there weren't many people around. I looked right in his eyes for a moment, and I saw uh, a look of, like, despair. Like, this guy was really down. And at that moment, I, I just had a deep sense. God was calling me to say something to the guy. Just you've, you've had that before. You see someone, and you feel like, man, maybe I could just say an encouraging word, let him know that God loves him or something. What can I do? And I looked right in his eyes, and, and he looked at me for a moment. And, but I was in such a rush that I just threw the groceries in there, and I kept driving. And that was like, a, I, it haunted me for the night. Because I had a sense that God had prepared something for me at that moment, and I missed it. I missed the assignment. I blew the assignment. And I think this week, I, I, I'm going to work differently. I, I'm, I'm walking in the neighborhood differently because I'm asking, Lord, who, who do you have for me this week to, to speak to? What do you have for me that you want me to do? And I think if we change the posture of our hearts to orienting about, God, what are you already doing? I think God will answer those prayers, and he'll show us what we need to do. So we are to be led by the Spirit. And so today is really an opportunity for us to get the frequencies of our hearts and our minds adjusted. And that's why we have our prayer team here. For some of you, maybe you, you came in today and you, you haven't been hearing God and you want to hear God. I want to invite you to come up for prayer. Maybe you're at a place where you want the courage to say yes to those invitations that God has for you. If you want the courage, I want you to come up for prayer. But God has blessed you. But, but here's the last thing I'll say here before I pray another prayer blessing over us is, these spiritual blessings are not for everyone. Not everyone can have these spiritual blessings. Only those who are in Christ have access to these blessings. Now, for some of you in this place here, maybe you're not even a Christian. Maybe someone invited you, and you currently don't have these blessings, but here's the invitation. You can have these blessings. They're waiting for you. They've been prepared for you. And so if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, we have our prayer team here. And at the end of the service, if you want to make a decision for that, he says, everything that read, you know, the hashtags, all that red put up on the screen here, that's for you to live in that reality. And maybe you're already a Christian. You're not living in that reality. Today's an opportunity to live in that reality today afresh. And so as we close here, we have our serve connection downstairs. You can come to that. Uh, Phil just reminded me we, there's a, a giant tailgate party downstairs as well. Uh, and so if you want to connect with other new lifers to watch the game uh, in the blue room, you can do that as well. Um, and so uh, many opportunities to connect here. But as we close here, I want to invite you to open your hands towards heaven to receive a blessing. Really, it's a reminder to let you know how blessed you already are. And may we walk out of this place different people, different than the way we walked in here. So brothers and sisters and sons and daughters of the living God, may the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May he shine his face upon you. May he fill you with peace. May you walk out of this building in the power of the Holy Spirit with a greater awareness of his presence, with a greater awareness of the works that he has prepared for you in advance. May you walk in them this week. And may you see transformation in the lives around you, whether at work or at school or at home or in your neighborhood. And so I bless you today in the strong, in the beautiful, in the resurrected name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Grace and peace, everyone. See you downstairs.